Good morning. And welcome to the Miami Shores Community Church. Happy New Year. And uh, I'm glad you're here. I'm Pastor Shane, and I'm, I'm also glad you're here as well. I have a number of announcements this week. Uh, first, you might notice, if you are particularly uh, eagle-eyed, you might notice a difference towards the back here. Uh, where did you go? I am not eagle-eyed, as you can tell. But you might have noticed that there, that, that is not, in fact, David Nagy. David is hiding back here. David, can you stand up for a second? I, I told him that I was going to her. David Nagy has been serving as our interim choir director over the past few months. And uh, some years ago, he served as the choir director here for, what, 20 more years? 20 years, number of years. Uh, and we'd like to thank him for his, uh, his service to us during uh, this time of transition, especially November and December. But we are pleased to announce that with this new year, we have our new uh, music director hired, uh, Mr. Tom Bates. Tom, you can stand up, please. <laughs> If you did not see the email that went out about this this past week, uh, Tom comes to us with decades of experience working both in, uh, in the school system as a choir director and in churches as well. Um, I find him uh, to be well organized, which is something I think that uh, this choir could benefit greatly from, uh, knowing some of you. <laughs> uh, Find him to be well organized, to be diligent, to be uh, really invested in the life of the church and making sure that this church succeeds. He wants to help out in lots of different ways, and he wants to connect with you. Even if you are not a direct participant in the music ministry, he wants to get to know you better. Uh, uh, helping out with that, uh, in the library, so if you go out into the, to the right, into the library, uh, after worship, we will be having... Uh, a brief coffee hour with some actual coffee and donuts. Uh, we hope you can make it there for that. We're excited about that as well, too. Now I'd like to invite Marilyn forward. She has a couple of announcements and a poem to read for us. The following menu 
which will be served during the flight. A cocktail of friendship, a supreme of health, a gratin of prosperity, a bowl of excellent news, a salad of success, a cake of happiness, all accompanied by bursts of laughter, wishing you and your family an enjoyable trip on board of flight 2023 before 2022 ends. Let me thank all the good people like you who made 2022 beautiful for me. I pray you be blessed with a faithful year ahead. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, people of God, who and what do we need to pray for? Continue prayers for Ukraine. Oh, yes, Ms. If you didn't hear that, that was from uh, Miss Kimco. Uh, she wanted to thank us and thank everyone who prayed for her husband, Don. We have been doing so for the past five months. Don is now completely healed and uh, will be going back to work soon. So uh, thank you for all your prayers and continued prayers and thanksgiving for Don on his, on his journey of healing and recovery. So. Yes. Young Arts. Um, they're having a transition in leadership, and as she serves the, the president of that organization, a, a prayer for her as well, that she might uh, learn to meet uh, his expectations and, and, and have a successful journey, professional journey. And I pray that we collectively recuperate our sanity over the next two years and not let this nation make the same mistake they did. That this nation might collectively recuperate its sanity. That's a, that's a great turn of phrase. 
uh, over the next few years and not repeat our same mistakes going forward. With that, I invite you to uh, take a minute, relax, either be calm, or just think for a little bit as we deepen into worship with the music of the prayer.
prayer of invocation in your bulletin. Holy God, enter this new year. We thank you for your presence with us in all the years of our lives. We have known joy and also sorrow, success and failure. And through it all, you have been with us, the companion of all our journeys. Much of life is fleeting, and so we thank you for things that are more. together our prayer of confession. Gracious God, our sins are too heavy to carry, too real to hide, and too deep to undo. Forgive what our lips tremble to name, what our hearts can no longer bear, and what has become for us a consuming fire of judgment. Set us free from a past we cannot change. Open us to a future in which we can be changed. Grant us grace to grow more and more in your likeness and image. Through Jesus Christ, the light of the world, we pray. Amen. And now let us take a moment of silent prayer and confession. Fear not, I bring you tidings of great joy for all people. Christ, our Savior, is born. As Jesus enters fully into our lives, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And now let us uh, provide, give each other, greet each other with a sign of peace. The peace of Christ be with you. Also with you.
changing nature of life. How things that we think are permanent never are quite as solid as we believe them to be. And this section, the most famous of uh, in the book, uh, is a, a wonderful expression of that. Read this reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. 
A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to sell. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What gain have workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be with, to be busy with. He has made everything suitable for its time. Moreover, he has put a sense of past and future into their minds, yet they cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I know that there is nothing better for them than to be happy and enjoy themselves as long as they live. Moreover, it is God's gift that they should all that they all should eat and drink and take pleasure in all their toil. Our second reading is from the book of Revelation, a book we do not preach on often except for this uh, selection. Um, this is one of my favorite selections of the Bible and all the Bible. Uh, it is a vision of God's future for us, the heavenly city of the New Jerusalem. Hear this reading from the book of Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them, and they will be his peoples, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tears from their eyes, every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also he said, Write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water as a gift from the spring of the water of life. There are many adjectives that you could use to describe Miami. Some of them are positive, uh, vibrant, young, the weather's usually good, there's good restaurants and food here. What are some other good words that we could use to describe Miami and South Florida? Beautiful. Beautiful. Culturally rich. Culturally rich. Diverse. Anything else? Wonderful weather. I would also add that there's a constant driving forward here. This is a city in motion, full of energy and vibrancy. The stagnation and quiet malaise of other parts of the country would find no purchase here. When I mentioned Miami is diverse. It's not hard to find people from a dozen nations on the street. But there are some downsides to Miami. I'll name a few of them. Many people need two doubt jobs to survive here. People here try to chase the quick buck often. And uh, this is, as you know if you've lived here a while, the fraud, one of the fraud capitals of the United States. Finding a good mover. Finding a a good mover or a good roofer. Uh, this is actually the roofing uh, fraud capital of the United States. Uh, and it's part of the reason, if you ever wonder why your property insurance bill is so high, it's because of roofing fraud. Uh, something like 30 to 40 percent of all of the fraud, roofing fraud in the United States happens in Miami. And that's the reason they charge extra rates here. Uh, the other one that I've identified for this sermon, and I know you have your own uh, adjectives that are more negative, I'm going to ask you to keep those with you. Uh, the other major flaw that I've identified is that this is a city with no real sense or regard for history. 
This is a, that driving energy that I talked about that pushes the city inexorably forward like a great Gatsby character means that we aren't good at looking backwards. Think about how old some, something has to be to be considered old here. My guess is about 20 years. And then something is old. It's an institution if it's 20 years old. However, today, when we stand on the threshold of the changing of the year, it's the perfect time to reflect on our own paths, our own pursuits, the shapes of the paths that we trod. Do we fly ever upward and onward, self-improving and increasing in holiness and communion with God, or are our lives a little more complicated than that? Our first reading is from the book of Ecclesiastes, a book with a unique perspective in the Bible. Some call it an early precursor to ex existentialist authors like Albert Camus or Soren Kierkegaard. And it rejects the common sense approach of the, of the book of Proverbs that wisdom and the path to onward to it are readily available, easily heard, and instead argues that life has no inherent meaning, that everything we build will eventually turn to dust, in that attempting to hold on to that which is temporary as though it were permanent is a recipe for either disappointment or disaster. Even included in that is the pursuit of wisdom and knowledge itself, which although the author concedes is better than the crass pursuit of riches, it also eventually has the same endpoint of meaninglessness. Although getting and pursuing wisdom and knowledge might be useful for ourselves, anyone who has ever tried to teach, to communicate that wisdom, what they have learned in life, knows just how little of it ends up getting transmitted. And generation and generation and time after time, eventually that wisdom and knowledge fades to be rediscovered again usually through painful lessons. Our reading is perhaps the most famous expression of that feeling of ephemerality, that life is an always changing collection of scenes, rather than a grand unified narrative play or musical theater production. All phases of life are temporary, disconnected even, it is in our minds that we connect them together. And we are reminded, too, that there is a time for everything. Life is not just building, building, building. There is also a time to break down. And by the end of the book, the author, usually called the teacher, settles on approaching life with a detached attitude. One that many have compared to the attitude of Zen practitioners. Take life as it comes. As sometimes things happen and there's nothing we can really do about it. Be well and follow the laws of God as you can. Do what you need to do, but know that there will be consequences. That said, it's not like karma. The earthly consequences of our actions are often not just or in fair balance or fairly distributed. Take this paragraph from Ecclesiastes, for example, that reminds us that sometimes luck and the ineffable vagaries of the universe don't perfectly sort out things in a meritocratic way. Again, I saw that under the sun the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor the bread to the wise, nor riches to the intelligent, nor favor to the skillful, but time and chance happen to them all. For no one can anticipate one's time. Like a fish taken in a cruel net, or like birds caught in a snare, so mortals are snared at, the t at a time of calamity when it suddenly falls around. 
can all probably think of some time in which it seemed like life came around us like a net trapping us. Christians have often struggled with this book, no more so than probably the 1700s and 1800s in Western Europe and America, particularly in the circles of liberal Protestantism in England and Germany that this church is descended from theologically. In that time, place, and culture, Many people were convinced that our paths had one way to go, ever upward and onward towards heaven. It was a time of rapid technological advancement, the Industrial Revolution. And tied into that was the idea of improvement. That, uh, that economic, moral, and political improvement accompanied technological improvement. And this saturated both politics and religion. Humanity was always improving, always getting more civilized, always getting closer to heaven. Remember, a a friend of mine told me that back in Victorian England, people were convinced that when you got to heaven, you were given a job. Because to be working was good, and heaven was good, so therefore you had to work in heaven. Do you know what happened to change that perception of, of human nature and, and life and things like that? World War I. World War One. Uh, although a friend has said that that actually started to change in America after the Civil War, too. But World War I in the 20th century. Millions died in ultimately meaningless conflicts born of the irrational hatreds of colonialism and nationalism. That is, those feelings that some people were subhuman and some people were more than human. No longer could people argue with a straight face that things would always be increasing towards a moral good. Guided by the invisible hand of God, who backed certain people in certain countries. A God who handpicked the winners and losers, always nudging us onto the proper course of history. After all, no God worth worshipping would have handpicked Hitler to pursue the Holocaust and the Second World War. So what does Christianity have to say to this moral crisis And what did it say, and what do we say now to it? And this was a question that preoccupied many Christian scholars after World War II, perhaps the question of the 20th century. I personally look to a guy named Reinhold Niebuhr, who may be familiar. He was a scholar and pastor in the United Church of Christ. He was the author of the Serenity Prayer. Uh, Barack Obama called him his favorite theologian. And I believe that he reconnects us a little bit with the author of Ecclesiastes. He proposes that it is our pride in our own knowledge and wisdom. Not our knowledge and wisdom, but our pride in our knowledge and wisdom. That is the source of our disconnection from God and our propensity towards evil. Instead of having an attitude of humility, We cling on to scraps of knowledge as though they were holy writ, and we elevate our wisdom or our perceived wisdom unto that of the gods. Everybody in Germany knew, knew that Jews were subhuman. Therefore, this gave them permission to degrade them into that. It also gave them permission to elevate themselves into superhumanity. If you've ever heard the word ubermensch, it's literally the superhuman. And that, Niebuhr says, is what sets the stage for moral disaster. 
Now, scholars have also read that back into Tommy, reading the struggles and the violence of colonialism. The settling of the United States was not a peaceful affair. You think about the Spanish in the New World, the French in Africa, the Germans, the English, wherever they went as well, nearly the whole world, and the violence that came through that. And embedded in that was pride in their own wisdom and knowledge. Perhaps an attitude of humility would be useful for all of us. I know it would be for me. On the larger scale, and this has been said before by people smarter and more eloquent than me, as much as we have the power to destroy our world over 70 times over through our weaponry, and we're doing so at a slightly less dramatic pace in the form of human-caused climate change, our increase in knowledge has not led to an increase in wisdom or humility. A tangible example is all those climate targets that always get set, we always blow right through them and keep on going. Our lives will change because of this, in our lifetimes. They have changed already because of this. There are now twice as many 90 degree days in a Miami summer than there were in 1950. If you ever wonder how old houses in Miami got away without needing air conditioning, it's because they didn't need it. It was only 90 a couple of weeks out of the year. Now it seems like most of the summer it's like that. In many ways, our lives will become a little bit harder. <coughs> and we can see here, to, to Raphael's point in his prayer, we combine this with social fragmentation, polarization, and a general decline in small d democratic governance in the United States. Our lives and those of our children and grandchildren will be very different than our own. But that's life. Everything is ephemeral. That shining city on the hill, the new Jerusalem of our second reading, is not Miami. But neither was it Boston, as the pilgrims thought it was even as they fought the Pequot War, King Philip's War, and massacred Native Americans. That shining city on the hill is a distant place. But it's also near to us, too. Its time has not yet come in fullness. Anyone can see that can live in our hearts, it can live in our minds, it can live in our hope. For it is in our hope that we yearn for it. When through the action of God, hopefully it inspires some small action in us to create a world in which our losses will fade. Our tears will be wiped away, and all manner of evil and pain and suffering will come to pass and be never more. Amen. And now let us take a moment of silent prayer. Please rise.
Please be seated. I invite you now to sit back in your, in your seat. Close your eyes if you want to. Roll your shoulders back a couple of times. Feel the tension in your face, your shoulders, your neck, your back, the rest of your body, all the way down to your toes. We're going to do two breaths, and on that first one, I want you to think about releasing that tension, finding the muscles that are, uh, that are tense, and then just trying to relax them. So let's breathe in, hold it, and breathe out and relax. And on our second breath, I invite us to uh, breathe out with a big, deep, and audible sigh. So let's breathe in, hold it, and breathe out and sigh. Let us pray. O oh God of new beginnings, and God of endings, we come before you today a people in need of your prayer, in need of your hope, in need of your comfort, in need of your grace, in need of your love. We pray today, especially for Ukraine, and in its continuing war with Russia. We come before you begging that as a society, as a country, as a world, that we might collectively recuperate our insanity and not repeat the same mistakes over and over again. We come to you with prayers of thanksgiving for Don Coe and the Coe family, for his healing and recovering. We give you thanks for Kim and in her patient care for him through a tough time. We give you thanks for all those who prayed for him, that their hearts may ever, that our hearts may ever be tuned towards your compassion. We pray for the Young Arts Association, or yeah, organization, as it leads into a time of transition. That your daughter, Donna Lane, might serve ably and nimbly during that transition and might be a peaceful one. Also pray for all those with chronic illness, those who are sick, those who are suffering, especially a particular young girl suffering from epilepsy. May she find the healing, comfort, and care that she needs. We continue our prayers for Anne Carr, for Jenna and John Snyder, for Mark Sal and Patricia, for Bill and Lolita Jenneret, for Ellie Wayington, her sister Virginia, and her great nephew Nick Derek. We pray for the Miami Shores Community Church in its time of transition. We pray for the new year, that it may bring us all, at least in some measure, hope and joy. And we pray for our village, for Miami Dade County, for South Florida for our country and our world. Father gave the sun. 
Let us pray. Oh God, we give you for the thanks that we give you thanks for all the gifts that you give us. The gift of a new year, the gift of new life, the gift of hope, the gift of being able to change, the gift of having a past, and the gift of not having it define us. O oh, Holy One, let us aspire to be as giving as you are in our own lives. Let us give freely and generously and love ever more so. In your holy name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. In Christ, God breaks down the walls that make us strangers to ourselves and divide us from one another. We are the body of Christ. At this table, we bear witness to the, our faith. At this table, God brings fullness out of brokenness and healing to our world. Let us break bread together. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our Let us pray. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Holy God, Creator and Ruler of the universe. You created light out of darkness and brought forth life on earth. You formed us in your image and called us to love and serve you. When we were unfaithful and turned from your ways, you did not forsake us. Your love remains steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made a covenant to be our sovereign God, and sent prophets to call us back to you, O Lord. In the fullness of time, you sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, to be our Savior. In him, your word, dwelling with you from all eternity, became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth, and we behold your glory, Emmanuel. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the celestial choirs and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. <laughs>
Bless us this bread and this cup, the wheat and the grain, the farmer and the harvest, the seed and the sower. These simple elements are shared in the community, so that we may taste and see your goodness and become one body in Christ. For it is through Christ, in Christ, and with Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, that all glory is yours, God's most holy, now and forevermore. Amen. And now let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us alongside Christians all around the world. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done. Let's pray together with prayer and thanksgiving. God, God, God of infinite mercy, we are people of heavens. Your never ceasing love surrounds us. Your great compassion embraces us. But we take these gifts for granted. Open our eyes to the wonders of creation. Tune our ears to the cries for love and the lonely world. Fill our
And may the God of peace and the peace of God be with you always. Go now in peace. Good, good. You did great. You did great. Yeah, that was nice.
That's my oh, who wants my banana bread when I get done? Uh, I banana bread. Oh, you got yeah, we all got Christmas. But perks of being in the choir. Go, 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 go. All right. Thank you. 